Welcome, everybody, to Core Voices. Thank you for joining us again this week. This is your space where your voice can be heard, where your questions can be answered and the things that you want to hear talked about can be talked about. If there's things you're holding in your heart that you want to find answers for or you just want to understand from a different perspective, send us your questions, send us your topics and suggestions to corevoices at gmail.com. It's a pleasure for me to be here as your host every week. I am Jasveer Kaur Rababan. And today on our show, we have a wonderful guest. In a few minutes, we're going to be welcoming Rajvinder Kaur Kera. She's an author, a lawyer, an activist, and founder of the Pink Ladu Project, which is now a global movement to reclaim gender equality in the South Asian community. They say that we can change the world one small step at a time. And that's exactly what the wonderful work Pink Ladu Project is doing. So please join me in welcoming Rajvinder to Core Voices. Hi, Raj. Hi, how are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for being on Core Voices and joining us today in this space so that we can talk more about the amazing work that you're doing. Thanks for inviting me, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. I know that there's still people joining on, but we're gonna jump right in with the questions. And there's a lot of people who don't actually know what Pink Ladu is, that it even existed. So if you can start from there and tell us, what is the Pink Ladu project? So the Pink Ladu project is a gender equality campaign where we encourage South Asian families to distribute Pink Ladu at the birth of their girls as a birth announcement. And the idea is that we want to encourage South Asian families to abandon sexist traditions and sexist customs and thereby empower women um, and also take part in the creation of new um, sort of gender balanced or sex balanced customs for women as well. And we we thought a lot about, you know, which custom should we be tackling and what should we be doing? And the reason we arrived on the Laddu is because the celebration of the birth of a boy um, and, and the tradition of only celebrating the birth of a boy is probably the first sexist custom any boy or girl will encounter in their lifetime. And we really believe it's important that if you want to encourage children to you know see themselves as equal regardless of their sex and if you want to live in a sex equal society then you mm -hmm. have to be perpetuating that message very early doors so we encourage families to celebrate the births of their girls with you know as much gusto as they would uh, for the birth of a boy it might feel a bit simplistic but the idea is that we are trying to create new social norms and mm -hmm. get people to change their behavior that's amazing <laughs> it's it's absolutely amazing and it yes for some people it can sound like a small thing but it's a massive thing because um the tradition of lori is to celebrate the birth of a boy that year right and that is how it used to be as a custom now it's evolved and people are celebrating the birth of their children in that year um and you know from punjabi customs we know that when boys are born traditionally everybody's going out and they're giving laddu um and i'm going to ask you this question why is it that they don't do the same for girls well i mean we often talk about this at pink laddu right that i mean i personally am not surprised you know that people aren't happy to have girls or that people don't want girls because we've created a system and a culture that effectively penalizes families for having daughters and often that penalty is economical it's financial so if you if you look at things like dowry or the tradition of um, only sons inheriting their parents estate or the tradition of sons you know looking after their parents in old age we've created all these customs that literally turn south asian women into burdens for their families and then we wonder why nobody wants a girl. So the reason why girls aren't celebrated, in my view, is because they're not seen as something, it's not seen as a good thing that's happened to the family because you are going to be severely economically and socially and culturally punished via this child, you know, for its lifetime. I mean, it doesn't, I remember having a conversation with somebody a few years ago that whether we think there is dowry 
today or not, there is. I mean, we, we might not call it dowry, but the practice of the girl's family paying for the wedding is dowry. And mm -hmm. it doesn't just stop there. You know, when a girl gets married, um, her nan ke give a nan ki shak. So that is, you are literally still paying for your daughter's children to have children and get their children married. Then, you know, when your daughter has a child, you have to go and take gifts for the in-laws and for this new baby. So the economic burden of this girl never ends. And you never, you don't really see this um, in the same way with, on the paternal side of families, right? You, there's no such thing as like a dadka shak. Like the dadke don't come with gold and gifts. Right. Uh, when, always the nanke that do that. And that's the mother's side, right? So you're constantly penalizing the mother and her family. Um, for being a girl and for having a child it's just it's, it's a never-ending cycle of financially penalizing people who have girls that's a very good point it's a very good point i mean imagine if there was a dad kishak right <laughs> no way it just wouldn't happen it just would not happen <laughs> then they wouldn't give out ladoos for boys either right <laughs> exactly exactly um yeah, it, it's it's just we've created a system where families are, you know, very severely punished for having girls. And then we wonder why people don't want girls. I don't, you know, I sympathize with those families because, mm -hmm. you know, any man or woman who, you know, has grown up 20 years ago and has got three, four, five girls, it's OK for them to be worried and thinking about how am I going to manage to pay for all the weddings of these girls when they live in a society that expects that of them. Yeah. And I think it was maybe we live in a different world now. Um, if we'd have gone back like even 10 or 15 years, I think in that era, it was still more difficult to make some of these changes in the psyche. Hannah? Um, and a lot of it, I mean, from my perspective, is the pressure from society to maintain these traditions that have existed for so long because they've passed, they've been passed down from generation to generation. Hannah? Um I'm sure that there must have been like an initiation point at the beginning, something within you that was like, okay, this is not okay. And now we need to do this. What was that moment for you? There've been several moments throughout my life. I mean, one of the first moments is when, so I'm the oldest, my dad's the only son and I'm the oldest. And then my sister is 10 years younger than me. And she was born after a long fertility struggle. And um, when she was born, you know, the reaction from the broader community was horrific. People came over to our house and sat on our living room floor and cried for months. It was like somebody had died. And um, oh yeah, it was really, really severe. Like, you know, my mum had very severe postnatal depression after that. Um, it was just a very, it was a very bizarre experience. And two years later, my brother was born. And obviously, you know, the reaction to his birth was very different. Everyone was overjoyed. And it was while packing the boxes of love do for my brother, at the, I remember this at the dining table with my mum, I just in passing said, you know, somebody should create something. Somebody should start a trend to mark the birth of a girl. Like maybe it should be cupcakes or something. I mean, I was only 12 at the time. And it kind of fell away. Like I didn't really think about it again. And, you know, it's a conversation that we've kind of, it, it's come up, you know, we've always talked about what happened when my sister was born, but, you know, you get busy with life. And, I was working in London as a lawyer when uh, about five years ago, and there was a lot of stuff going on um, in the media at the time about getting women onto boards. So making sure that, you know, the boards of all these big companies, there are more women on them. And I remember sitting back and thinking, like, it's really nice that there are these broad gender equality initiatives going on in, you know, in the workplace to help people like me get to the top or whatever. But what's going on in the homes of, of people like me that might be dragging these women down or dragging them back, uh, regardless of these efforts in the workplace? And I started thinking, you know, that I, I, I guess I kind of grew up thinking that, um, you know, this will change in my lifetime. Like by the time I'm older, it, you know, boys and girls will be treated the same. It won't matter. And, you know, as I grew up, I kind of saw that nothing was changing and I had said to friends on many occasions that like somebody needs to start something to mark the birth of a girl like it would take off like wildfire mm -hmm. and um, I just kind of never really knew what that was and then I heard about a um a sort of dance charity in Toronto selling pink laddu 
And when I heard about it, I was like, this is genius. Like this, <laughs> this is it. Like it's not a cupcake. It's not anything else. You know, it, it has to be a pink ladu because the symbol is so <laughs> powerful. Um, and that's when we kind of um, came up with the, and I say we, I mean, you know, I came up with the campaign and, you know, tried to encourage as many South Asian families as possible to use the pink ladu in the celebration of their girls. Wow. And you started in Toronto then? No, so I'm not affiliated with that group at all. So they were a dance group and they were selling Pink Ladu as a way of raising money for their dance group. Uh, and Pink, the Pink Ladu itself isn't new. Like lots of sweet shops have sold them before. There's a film um, that came out in 2003 called Pink Ladu's and it's about a girl that has triplet girls and stuff. The Pink Ladu as a concept isn't new, but when I heard about it, it was the first time I'd heard about a Pink Ladu. Right. And I this this is the trend like this is what it needs to be to like this is the suite that's going to make people celebrate their girls one family's going to do it and everyone else is going to see them doing it and it's going to sort of start snowballing and I need to make it snowball by sharing people doing it so I need to use this suite to kind of convince people to do it so yeah, it's, it was a weird sort of roundabout story, but that's how I arrived at what the suite should be. Wow. And then what was the first implementation of using the pink ladoos or giving the pink ladoos in this gesture? So, I mean, we had to do a, a series of PR stunts, right? Because I also knew that um, <laughs> the Indian community, in order for them to take me seriously, it, it's, it needs to either be on the news or it needs to be in the paper and it needs to be in a decent newspaper. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, um, we basically just like decide, I mean, I, we don't do events on the ground. We are purely a social media campaign. I'm convincing people to change their behavior through the internet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have the capacity to go and knock on doors and stuff. But for the first year, just as like a launch stunt, we just gave out Pink Ladu to some babies born um, at a hospital in Birmingham. But like there were only like three Indian families there, you know, so it wasn't really, it wasn't, that wasn't the impact point, but you know, the press came, we got a lot of exposure from it and it kind of, it grew um, from that. And then I was able to leverage that on social media and, you know, encourage people to pay attention to what we were doing. That's amazing. And sometimes, you know, that's what you have to do. You have to kind of kick and fuss and get people's attention, Hannah. Right? And it's it's important that we do this because it's one of those things that just got embedded into the norms of who we are as a community, right? Where Sikhi teaches us about equality, but our Punjabi culture discriminates from birth, right? Um, it's, it's almost like the same as um, back in the day, I don't know how it is now, they would take the boy's name at the Gurdwara, but a girl's name would just be like kind of picked out of a hat at home or something, Hana. Um, is uh, is that something that you've heard or you've experienced? No, I didn't know about that, but it doesn't surprise me because girls aren't worth the fuss. Right. So it, at the time that I was born, um, that was something that was very common and amongst all of like extended family and stuff as well. For the boy, um, like a few days after coming from the hospital, they'll take the boy. Uh, like the child and they will go to the hospital and they would then um, take a hukumnama from the Guru Granth Sahib and once they take a hukumnama the first letter of the Shabad would be the, the letter that they would use to select the name and it's in that moment there's no like spending a week to think about it or brainstorming or you know you if you're taking the hukam then you follow the protocol Hannah. so you yeah. use that letter like yours is an r and your parents said rajvinder or you know hypothetically Hannah. um for boys this was normal this is what would happen um for the girls that were born in my family there are actually not many girls in my family um all of their names were taken at home and um some of my like Rishtidar who were not very um, like religious they just took all of the names at home um, but the one thing that my mom told me like she told me like many many years ago that actually makes me feel happy is that when it came to me so I am one of four kids I have three brothers two older and one younger that when I was born my mom 
and my dad both insisted and literally fought my daddy and like everybody else who was around Chachi Pua, whoever else, that my name will also be taken at the Gurdwara. And it was at New Hampton Road Gurdwara. <laughs> so, I mean, they didn't they didn't give laddu for me. I asked my mom. I asked her today actually. I didn't know if they did or not. And then I was like, why didn't you give laddu for me? Um and it wasn't was, a dumb thing. It just wasn't. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. But and that's one of the reasons why Pink Ladu is so powerful because there's so many families who are ready to, to celebrate their girls, but they feel like if they do that, they're the only ones doing it. And something like Pink Ladu is really powerful because, you know, it gives them the illusion that there's thousands of people doing this as well. So you don't feel alone. So if there's a woman out there who wants to celebrate her daughter and she says it to her mother-in-law and her, her mother-in-law and father-in-law say, well, no one's doing this. She just show the campaign, like everyone's doing it. Like, look at this. So it gives you that illusion of mass. And that is really important because no, as much as we all like to think we are would want to be trailblazers, being a trailblazer is very, very hard. And it comes mm -hmm. off at a great personal cost. So, so it kind of gives the illusion of everyone doing it until everyone is actually doing it. And that's what we were kind of trying to create. We made it look like everyone was doing it until everyone was actually doing it um, to help people you know follow that momentum and copy each other because right. um, social proof is like a well documented phenomenon that people copy each other's behavior that's why if there's two restaurants on the high street people are more likely to go into the one that has people inside it even if it's, if it gets worse reviews than the other one we, we just do what other people do um, so i'm not surprised there were no ladu given out when you were born it would have just been groundbreaking like who wants to be that person right nobody at that time but um, where do you think we are now? Do you think that we're closer to like, like making it a norm? Um, it's funny because in the four years, so four and a half years that I've been doing Pink Ladu, so, you know, it's kind of taken off. So now, and I just want to put out there, we don't get any money, I don't get a penny from the sales. You know, we don't make Ladu, we're not involved in any of it. I don't see anything, you know, it, uh, no money comes to me or Pink Ladu from the sales of anything I do or anything else, you know, there's, it's not a charity or anything. Um, but since we we started doing it, uh, like thousands of families have celebrated their daughters with Pink Ladu, you know, Pink Ladu are now available across Australia, the US, Canada and the UK, and it's solely due to demand that's been generated from the campaign. So. From that perspective, I do think something is changing. That mm -hmm. you know, something, there's definitely a moment. I think we're we're all experiencing a moment. But I think what you have to remember, is, and this is something you know, I read a little while ago that it's not a war. It's just the same fight to be had over and over and over and over again. And whenever there are systems of power and there are systems of imbalance, there will always be people taking the opportunity to oppress another group of people, whether that's on race or whether it's on sex. So I don't think the battle is over until every sexist custom is eliminated. And I've only taken on one, right? So I'm hopeful in the sense that if people are celebrating their daughter's births, which is actually quite a big deal. Mm -hmm. They will then engage with all the other customs as well. So things like lori and you know dowry and paying for weddings and all the other weird stuff that happens. They will, it will force them to think about all of that as well later on. But mm -hmm. you have to remember this is one out of hundreds of sexist behaviors and customs. So I'm optimistic, but I'm also not. You know. I, I think I'm also a realist in that I accept that, you know, um, this this is something that we will constantly have to fight against. Right. But it's it's a small step at a time that we can make a change, Hannah. And I think it's amazing. It's it's impossible to do everything and to fight every single angle of gender equality. But if you can even create joy from the birth of a daughter, you've already changed her narrative for the rest of her life. Hannah. There's um, a question or a statement that came in, uh, which I'd just like to read to you and get your response. It's Jasper. He said, the world has changed now. There is no concept of discrimination. People do celebrate birthdays of girls, same like boys. 
Back in India, things are different. And in the UK, things are different. So please only give facts of UK and not of India. Um, I don't really know what that means. So the world has changed now and there is no concept of discrimination. People do celebrate birthday of girls, same like boys. Back in India, things are different and in UK, things are different. Please only say facts. Uh, one thing I will say is that anecdotes don't make data. So um, just because you uh, heard a story of something happening to someone, that does not mean that that's happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the data across the board does show that we still live in a society that discriminates on the basis of sex. And that's not just South Asians, it's everybody. You see it in the gender pay gap, you see it in the lack of female CEOs, mm -hmm. the lack of female politicians, um, the disproportionate amount of care work and domestic work that women do. So this isn't just an illusion. I really wish it was just a fantasy in my head, but it's really not. This is science. Um, it is the, you know, just gender discrimination is the quantifiable um, measure of preference that men have over women in society. And uh, it's not just South Asians. Uh, I, I really like that this person lives in a world where um, all the girls are celebrated, um, like boys. That's, I've, I'm really happy that this is their experience. It's not, not my experience. It's not the experience of many women that I know. And the data doesn't suggest that this is everybody's experience either. So I think it's always really important to remember that anecdotes do not make data. And that whilst it is very tempting to um, make broad inferences based on a few things that we see, it, that isn't the way the world works. Just because, you know, you see five families give out love do for their daughters doesn't mean everyone's doing it because again, anecdotes do not make data. So it's really important to always remember what you're seeing is your own microcosm and it can't always be extrapolated out to the world. Absolutely. And, and I 100% agree with you. I think this is the case with a lot of the topics that we've been touching on in this space every week in Core Voices. Last week, I had uh, Manjeet Gill from Binti Period. And there was a lot of people who thought that everybody knew what a period was, right? It turns out that they don't. Hence the reason that there has to be organizations which are giving education about menstrual hygiene and health. Um, there's a need for pink ladu, that's why it exists. And I think that that question or that statement was coming from uh, the perspective that India does not, um, they don't discriminate according to gender, but the UK might. That was where I felt that statement was coming from. Um, so my next question is, how far across the world does your work extend and does it reach to India? So my work only extends to the diaspora. So that means um, immigrant communities that have, you know, hail from South Asia, but live in other parts of the world now. And that's because um, I'm, I'm very loath. <laughs> the relationship that the West has with places like India is very complex. And I have to appreciate that my experience as a South Asian woman is Brit in Britain is not the same as the experience of a South Asian woman in South Asia. And I don't want to be the type of person that imposes my values or my life experience on people on the subcontinent, because mm -hmm. to my mind, that's a very white savior narrative that like, oh, I'm from the West. Let me tell you what's right. This is what you should do. And I don't really want to be a part of that narrative. I think the situation um, in India is much more complex as well, because you have a lot of different discriminations that intersect in India. So you've got a lot of caste issues, you've got, you know, socioeconomic problems, you've got, you know, sort of religious discrimination as well. So I can't really comment on that because I don't live there and that's not my experience, but I am a part of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I am, you know, I, I am familiar with what it means to be a South Asian woman not living in South Asia and thus my campaign focuses only on the diaspora. Um, so, so far, you, you know, we've had um, people giving out Ladu for their daughters. Uh, majority, 90% of my following is outside of South Asia. So around 50% is from the UK, around 20 to 30% is from Canada, and the remainder is from the US and Australia. So it's majority UK and Canada, and then sort of the rest of the world kind of thing. And what would it look like to take Pink Ladu to India? Because personally, I feel there's a lot of suffering for the girl child in India. Um, poverty is a reason. And all of the different you know, factors that you just laid out, they all play a role. Um, and it is 
classed as more of a burden there to have to give birth to a daughter than it would be in the West, right? Um, and there's a lot of female infanticide that goes on there as well. So do you think that it could ever be possible to take Pink Ladu there? Maybe, but I feel like, you know, I, I just can't comment. I mean, I feel like the the problems that Indian women face are so different and so intense and I don't live there. I'm not living under a Modi government. You know, I don't know what other realities they have to face. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, I just, I can't, I just can't comment on what it would take and what it would mean because it's just not my experience and I can't, I can't speak to it. Okay. And do you, do you want to say anything about female infanticide in India? Um, I am a firm believer. I mean, infanticide is one thing. So I think obviously it's heinous. You should not be killing your children. I mean, and I think infanticide is one thing, but there's also like, you know, the girl child in India also just has a very low mortality rate, you know? So um, sick girls, like not sick as in sick, but ill, like poorly unwell children under the age of five who are girls are much less likely to survive than boys. You know, doctors report that a girl is usually much more severely ill when she's brought to the hospital than a boy. Like the boy, you know, first sign of being ill, they rush to the hospital. But with a girl, she has to be quite seriously ill before the family will take her. So, yeah, it sucks. It's really, really shit. But, I mean, again, it goes to that point of we've created a system that economically and financially penalizes families with girls. So, you know, often these are families that don't, you know, they just don't, can't prioritize something that's seen as a bad investment. It comes down to that, I think. And it's not, I, I get really upset when people say that this is an unbar problem, this is Gribanda problem. It's not a Gribanda problem. It's not an unbar problem. Amir, Pare are as bad at this as everybody else. So it's not fair to just blame, you know, the, the poor people because, you know, Amir families have a lot to lose as well if they don't have sons. They have a lot of Jedaf that they, they will lose if they don't have a boy that they can pass it on to. Mm -hmm. And the expectation will be very big, you know, Mercedes and cars and all this other stuff. So Amir families have a lot to lose as well. And they participate in this as much as the Garib families do. So it's very unfair. I see a lot of that, that people just say like, oh, Garib on the problem, you know, in on Patani. It's Parilikhe Log are as bad at this. Um, as anybody else so it's not fair to just blame poor people or uneducated people yeah. when this is everybody's problem thank you thank you for saying that I, I truly I know I appreciate that and I know that everybody who's tuning in is they're also going to appreciate that because we want this to be a space where we can talk about the real issues Hannah and the truth is this is an issue which you know goes across all aspects of the spectrum it's not restricted to a group of people or a type of people and it exists in a different way across the world as well, right? Um, what sort of obstacles or like negative comments have you received in the process of trying to do the work that you're doing? Um, I get a lot of really defensive comments from uh, mothers of sons. So um, women who have boys that, you know, get very defensive over Pink Ladu. Um, sometimes they feel like, um, you know, I'm creating a situation that, um, you know, boys are not wanted anymore or boys aren't special. You know, I, I, so I, I wrote a book and people often say to me, you know, why did you write a book stories for South Asian supergirls? It should be for boys and girls. You know, and my response to that is that boys have been worshipped through these customs for thousands of years. Boys already have a laddu. Like, so what if a girl gets a pink ladu that is not sexist to a boy, you mm -hmm. know, not sexist to a boy that now there's something to celebrate a girl when there's been something to celebrate a boy for hundreds of years. Um, it's not necessarily a negative comment, but something I see a lot which really frustrates me is when people sort of blame women for this. When I see comments that say like, oh, it's always women, you know, women who make these comments, men don't care, men don't say anything. <laughs> I mean... Yes, I understand this, but I'm not I'm not going to punch women for this. I'm not going to blame women for this because we live in a system where women are told from the day that they are born um, that they are worth less than a man. And I'm not saying that you say this to your daughter, but if you celebrate 
your, if you don't celebrate your daughter's birth, the message you are giving her is that she's not worth as much as a boy. And we live in a system that tells mm -hmm. girls these messages every single day. We see it in the media, we see it in the news, we see it in film, music, arts, politics, you know, science, it's everywhere that women are classed as inferior, right? So if a woman grows up to believe those negative messages about herself and believes that women are shit, is it her fault? Um, is it any surprise that so many older South Asian women don't want their sons or daughters to have girls? Has anybody ever asked these women what their opinion is of themselves? You know, the next, I get a lot of women that will say, oh, I went to the Godwara and some Bibi came up to me and said, Tere munda hove. And, you know, all of this stuff. And I often say to them, like, next time I want you to ask that woman, the mata do you think you are worth something? Do you think you are worth as much as a man? And she will probably say no. She will probably say, like, I'm nothing, you know, men are way better than me. So is it any surprise then that she wants you to have a boy because she believes she's garbage, right? So, and this is what people don't understand. And I get, I get quite frustrated with this because women are not the problem, right? Like women are not to blame for patriarchy. Women have internalized patriarchy. Women receive messages about them being inferior every single day from every aspect of life. And if some of these women grow up to believe these messages, that is not their fault. And men don't need to make these kinds of statements. They, the system is doing it for them. You know, the whole system exists to worship men. So men don't need to say these kinds of statements. And I'm personally of the belief that as a man, you know, you have a duty to speak out about this. And I'm not going to celebrate you for speaking out about it. You don't get an award for being a good boy. You know, if you're if you're being a decent human <laughs> being and um, just speaking out about gender inequality, that is your duty because yeah. you benefit from patriarchy every single day. You benefit from the fact that men are seen as superior. Even if you never say anything nasty to a woman, even if you're always nice to all the women that you know, you still benefit every single day from patriarchy. So you have a, a duty to make sure that you are actively working to dismantle patriarchy and dismantle male preference. So yeah, I get quite upset when I see messages and comments of people always saying, it's just, Buriya don't care. Buriya just believe they are garbage. This is why they say this stuff. Mm. You know, and I, my, my daddy did not have a very nice reaction when my sister was born. But my daddy was also born in 1924. You know, she was the oldest of seven children. She never went to school. She, you know, her brothers were taken to school. She didn't get to go. She lived her whole life listening to men. Um, tell her what to do, right? She never had any choices. She just did everything. First, she did everything her dad said, then her husband, then her son. And she had a very low view of herself as a woman. Like she, she was a very proud woman and she took care of herself, but she very much believed that she was not worth as much as a man. And so I can't criticize her for being upset mm -hmm. that, you know, she had a granddaughter because she believed women were trash, including herself that's that's so powerful like I I'm just I love everything you're saying and I'm grateful for you to say this for those people that aren't familiar with what internalized patriarchy is can you help us to understand that because many people everything you're saying is going to come as a shock to them it's a wake-up call that hang on a second my my mom or my grandma or my aunt would think that they're less worthy than a man and they would think that they're trash it's true because that's what's been embedded subtly into the layers of their psyche over the years. That's what's been beaten into them literally. And they'll, they'll be oblivious to what the notion of internalized patriarchy even is and how it would reflect in their own mother. Yeah. I mean, and this is, this is the thing with patriarchy, right? And this is the thing with um, male preference so patriarchy is you know held as like it means the power the power structure that is owned by men and it also means um the preference of males in in the society that we live in and in order for patriarchy to exist 
both men and women are fed messages constantly about women being inferior and men being superior. And we see this, there are, you know, we could do a whole episode on just the examples of the type of garbage we are fed about men being better than um, women and it's very very subtle sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's it's really blatant right but this happens and it still happens today and it happens in all societies around the world all major societies you know including the UK so is it a surprise then yeah. is it a surprise if I as a young girl grow up seeing messages that tell me that I am not as good as a boy um, I'm not as clever I'm not as athletic my brain is smaller um, I, I'm not able to do maths the way that boys can do maths. If I'm fed these images constantly that tell me that I'm inferior to a man, is, is it going to be a shock if I grow up to then believe that actually men are better than women? And some women believe this, right? And they really do. And I, it's funny because I grew up in a, you know, I am who I am today, but it hasn't always been like this. And I remember as a child, like, you copy what you see the grown-ups doing. And I remember as a child, like, you know, children are very keen to act mature. You kind of want to act like, you know, you know you're know, you really, really Sienna and you know what's going on. <laughs> and I remember, like, you know, be, being as young as, like, 9 or 10 and being really concerned if someone was pregnant. Like, is she going to have a boy? Oh, God, I hope she has a boy. Like, oh, my God, I really hope she has a boy. I mean, I was 9. But by 9, I already understood that, like, boys are really important. You know, you, you should want to have a boy. Everybody should have a boy. Girls are bad. Like, you don't want to have a girl. It's not a good thing. So mm -hmm. if I, as young as 9, having grown up here, could internalize that kind of message, you know, it, it happens all the time. Like, it's not it's not difficult to imagine that our grandmas and aunts and mothers might not feel like they are worth as much as our fathers. It's yeah. probably true, you know? If your mum still makes sure that your dad eats before she does, it's probably because she thinks he should and because he's more important than her. <laughs> like, that's the one way it works out, right? Yeah. Oh if your mum doesn't call your dad by his name, if your dad calls your mom tu and your mom calls your dad tusi, that's a big power difference, right? It's it's a really big statement. And it's saying that one is more important than the other. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. I'm how many times we see that in households, right? Where the women feed the men and they eat later. Um I know this from the things, the stories that my mom told me, Hana. Um that it wasn't seen important when he was in India. My mom, you know, she's the eldest of 10 kids, um, born and raised in India in Punjab. And at that time, um, it wasn't seen important to send your daughters to school. It was more important to teach them skills of how to look after the animals, the majah, to, you know, look after the fields and take care of the home. Because when they get married, that's what their skill set's going to be. That's what's going to be useful to them for the rest of their lives. It's what was what their mothers had to train for as well. So they felt it was more important to send to keep them at home and train them um, to be a good housewife um, and a homemaker, if that's what you want to call it. But it was a housewife and send the boys to school. Um, my nanaji was somehow in that time more forward thinking and he insisted on getting his daughters educated um, and they didn't go off to university and things like this but they went through up until like say high school which at that time for the rest of the pind was absurd they thought that he was crazy and wasting his money and his time and how was that going to benefit them in their lives but that's just an example of where it begins from if you're born in that culture where you're seeing girls are not being sent to school, but boys are, that the boys get something that's better quality than the girls, you know, it's it's already there in the layers. And there's um, a comment that came in from somebody, I don't want to say their name because I don't uh, agree with what they've said. They're, they're saying that this is a time to remember God and not to claim our equality. And for me, that's what the problem is. These people are the problem. So what would you say to that? I say I remember God by reinforcing my equality. God made me equal. Man took that away from me. So I'm just taking what's my God-given right and making sure that people do the same. So, um, yeah, this is a time to remember 
of a god, but that doesn't mean that God God also, I mean, I'm not a Sikh scholar, so I can't speak to Sikhi. And my ideas of what Wahiguru says to me are my ideas. I'm not going to try and say that to everyone else. But in Sikhi, God also says you have to live in the community. You can't just go into the jungle because everybody can find God in the jungle. You have to live in the community and you have to do seva. And this is my seva. This is my seva for my community. So I do my Simran and Pink Ladu is my seva. And that's why I don't take money for it. So, you know, it's yeah it's it, i think it's absurd to say that you know this isn't um that th this somehow doesn't correlate with religion because i just i don't really understand how that works i <laughs> i agree i i totally agree but i think it's important to know that these are some of the voices that exist out there as well where people don't see it important or in their mind they think that equality already exists and you know we're just a bunch of women who are making a noise who are making loads of noise about nothing right but the fact is Sikhi was formed on equality those were the founding fact founding points from Guru Nanak that to lift all humans up regardless of gender caste creed color none of that stuff like we were brought to the same platform and it's you're right it's man that took that away and right now if those men are not educating themselves about it or respecting the voice that we're sharing now and even Pink Ladoo and other organizations too then they become part of the problem yeah so, absolutely and I think uh, you know and, and it, like I would only say this here because this is, you know, this is a Sikh platform. So this is where we talk about Sikhi. And otherwise, I don't share any religious messages on Pink Ladu. I try and keep, you know, Pink Ladu um, secular. So we don't do any sort of religious conversation on there. But I think, you know, a big part of Sikhi is living in the community, living in your Sangha, living in your, in your world, you know. It, you don't achieve Sikhi by living in the jungle. So you have to live in this, this community. You have to solve the problems that exist in this community. You have to work with your neighbor and work with your community and work with everybody around you to make a better community. So I think this idea that we should all just lock our doors and sit inside and do Simran, that doesn't work either. Like that's not Sikhi either, you know, Absolutely. because it's it's not about the, it, it's the individual experience but it's also the collective experience and mm -hmm. you know that's why there's a specific emphasis on not going into the jungle and just doing anybody can find god in the jungle but it's a challenge to find god in the real world right like mm -hmm. it's yeah so i i completely just disagree with that idea that doing work like this is somehow um conflicting with religion i just don't i don't agree right Absolutely. And I think it's about opening our minds, taking away the ego and just looking into that reality of what actually happens in the world versus what we think happens in the world. And um, for all the men out there that are listening, these are, you know, two Sikh women in front of you right now who are talking to this subject because this is happening. This is real. And that's why we need Pink Ladu to help us to understand that from inception from the birth of a daughter coming into the world you can change her whole destiny by empowering her and making her feel equal or you can rob her of that by making her feel like she's not worth anything and people also say funny things like you know in Sikhi it shouldn't be like this like you have to understand that like religion you know is is one part of how people live you know mm -hmm as a collective religion informs how we live culture informs how we live our surroundings inform how we live so just because our religion is perfect doesn't mean our culture is right so when people start saying that like yes i agree even without religion it shouldn't be like this but that doesn't mean that it's not happening so how are we going to deal with it right like just constantly mm -hmm. repeating over and over again it doesn't fix anything so you have to actively go out there and create new traditions that value girls and like dismantle sexist customs that you know elevate boys so just sitting there and saying you know that doesn't change anything you Absolutely. have to, you, you have to get people to do something different on the ground Mm -hmm. and change their behavior and that the whole point of Pink Ladu is 
you know, people are changing their behavior slowly because every time a family goes to a sweet shop to get an order of pink lundu for their girls, they're changing their behavior, right? That is a, be a massive behavioral leap that they've made. And psychologically, that's really, really powerful. It's very, very profound. And it's something that they will always remember. Um, and that's why I think, you know, these things, they don't just exist in a bubble. Like you have to, you have to, you know, live in dunya dari and, and try and coordinate around it. Right. And what advice or suggestions could you give to people to try to engage in breaking some other norms as well? So maybe somebody who's not a parent yet um, or somebody who's already got children and, they're, you know, the children are maybe older. What sort of things could they do to break some of these um, flawed norms? I think one thing that's really important to accept and to realize is that we are all biased. Me and you and everybody listening, we are all biased. And that doesn't make us bad people. It just means we have grown up in a system that has brainwashed us into being biased. The, the first step in changing your behavior, and, and everybody will say this, whether you are an addict, whether you're an alcoholic or a smoker, or you, you know, have you're addicted to cookies. Um, the first step to changing your behavior is admitting what the problem is. So in order to change, you have to admit that even if I don't feel like it, I am biased. I am. I just that's just a fact. So I have to acknowledge and accept my biases and really think twice about the things that I'm doing and slow down and ask myself, where is this coming from? What message am I giving my children with this behavior or with this um, action that I'm taking here? Like the very first step is accepting that you are biased. Until we can all accept that we are biased, nothing will change because we'll all just be busy sitting here saying like, I'm not biased. I think girls and boys are equal. I don't do anything wrong. We are all biased, every single one of us, me included, because that is how we've been brainwashed. You know, so you have to accept that you are biased and then step back and and, and start peeling back the layers, you know, really examine the way you treat your children. You know, you don't punish yourself just because you are biased doesn't mean you're a mean, evil person, but just slow down and think about it and, you know, unpack the ways in which you might be parenting through bias mm. and um you know try and change that subtly if your son doesn't do the dishes but your daughter always does maybe ask your son to do them you know things like that it's like trying to um understand your own conditioning that's really mm -hmm. important um there's a question that came in is that did anyone in your family tell you that you're less than a boy they didn't need to say it to my face when people came to my house and cried for two months when my sister was born, it told me that I was less than a boy. Mm. They were crying because she was a girl. They literally sat on the floor and screamed like somebody had died. Like, you know, it was, does someone need to say to me, you're not as good as a boy, or do they just need to do that? And I got the message, you know? Yeah. I grew up in a family mm. where the men always ate first. I grew up in a family where the boys got away with much more than the girls did. The girls were told, you're not allowed to go out, you can't do anything. The boys had girlfriends and they went out and they did whatever they wanted. The boys were allowed to go away for university, but the girls weren't. Um, mm -hmm. The boys got all the inheritance, but the girls didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. All of those things added together told all of us that we were worth less than boys because they were designed to do that. So no, nobody said to me, no one sat me down and said, you are not as valuable as a boy, but they didn't need to do that because it was coming from everywhere else. Absolutely. And what was it that made you go and write your amazing book, The Stories for South Asian Supergirls? It's actually one woman in there, um, Pritam Kaur Hare. I don't know if you've read the story of her, but Pritam, um, she's, she's really old now. She's probably like 95, but she moved to Canada in the 60s. And she, like many um, women, you know, were berry picking, working in farms. You know, it's a big community, Indian community in Canada, and the older people generally work in the farms. And she was being treated really badly by her employers. And she led a worker strike. You know, this, this she's born, she's the same age as my grandma. She was born in like 1927 or something. And um, she looks like everyone's daddy, right? She just looks like a grandma. But she led a worker strike. 
She, um, you know, took her former employer to court for firing her. She was then like vice president of the farm workers union. She was an amazing woman. And I remember when I came across her art, an article about her, I just remember thinking like, I feel so sad that I didn't know about her. And there's so many other women like her that are such amazing, inspirational South Asian female role models. But because the media only focuses on Bollywood or white people, we just never hear about these women. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was really important that South Asian girls are given a collection of these stories so that they can read this and realize that they, you know, we have some really amazing women in our history. Like, yeah, so I think when I read Pritham's story, I just, I just couldn't believe that this woman had done so much, but nobody knew her name. It just mm. really blew my mind, actually. Um, I think if I've, if I've got it, oh, I haven't got it. I was looking for a copy. If I had a copy here, I'd show you. But um, yeah, I think that was the main, the main push. Because um, when I then when I started researching Pritham, I learned about other women. So I learned about like Kalpana Chawla, who's the first. Indian astronaut and I remember watching um so she was she went to space in 2001 and her spacecraft um it disintegrated as they were re-entering the earth's atmosphere and I was living in Canada at that time and I remember it being all over the news like these seven or eight ast um, astronauts have all died but I never knew that there was an Indian woman in there you know I watched that yeah. news cycle I, all summer I, we were sat watching and, and looking at this news cycle but I never knew that there was an Indian woman in there and I found that so tragic, you know. I didn't know that either. Yeah, she, yeah, she's brilliant. She's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And so, it was when I came across the stories of these women that I just thought, like, it's it's so sad to me that no one knows who they are. And if we don't tell their stories, I don't know who will. Right. If we're not going to celebrate these great women, who who is right? Exactly. Yeah. So tell us more about the book, because I don't know if everybody out there has heard about it. If you haven't heard about it and you haven't bought it, go and get your copy now. Stories for South Asian Supergirls. You need um, I think I have a copy here. Give me one second. Yes. You need to get this for your daughters, for yourselves, for your husbands as well. These are the stories that we can share with our next generation and keep them inspired, right? So this is the book. It's called Stories for South Asian Supergirls. Uh, I just want to say that I don't get any money from this book. 100% of my proceeds go to charity supporting women and children. Pink Ladu is not a charity, so I'm not just sending money back to Pink Ladu. <laughs> Um, the money goes to, in England, the money goes to Child Poverty Action Group. Um, and in Canada, it goes to the Canadian Women's Foundation. And they do work wow. with women suffering from domestic violence. So it's just it's just got a collection of biographies of amazing women. So um, here you've got Noor Jahan. Can you see? Yes. Um, so each, there's 50 stories. And there's an illustration and then a biography. Um, and there's some, there's some really, really cool women in here. So we've got Noor Jahan, we've got, um, who else? Uh, Nadia Hussain from Bake Off. Awesome. Um, we've got uh, Jhumpa Lahiri. She's an amazing writer. I think she's won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Wow. For the Prize. Uh, Noor Inayat Khan, who was a spy in World War II. Um, that's incredible. Really, really awesome. I'm trying to find Pritam. Um, here's Pritam. Pritam Kaur here. So this is the, wow. the main story that I found, and I just thought, oh, my God, everybody needs to know about her. So it's a collection of biographies of 50 uh, amazing South Asian women. Some are from history. Some are alive now, but they're all just, you know, really awesome South Asian women. It's available in all good bookstores. You can get it. If you're in the UK, you can get it from, like, Waterstones or Foils. In North America, it's in uh, Walmart, uh, Indigo Chapters, Barnes and Noble. Um, and one of Pardon? Can you get it on Amazon? You can get it on Amazon as well, yeah. Awesome. I'm just looking for one. Uh, one of my favorites, actually, was Maharani Jankor. Um, she, like, I don't think I really understood Sikh history until I was researching for this book and I was researching Maharani Jind Kaur's life. Mm -hmm. And um, I just realized, you know, just how much history and legacy there is um, mm -hmm. and how much we have to be proud of that we just don't know about, which is Absolutely. just crazy. Absolutely. Oh, my God. I'm... 
I'm so grateful that you put together that book and everybody needs to read it. There's loads of people who are asking where they can get it from and where they can read it. And somebody said their daughter has it and she's going to go off and read it now as well. And that's amazing. It's important to keep the inspiration alive and history shouldn't be written from 500 years ago alone. There should be, we should be creating our new chapters of history as well. So I'm, I'm grateful that the book's out there. Yeah. <laughs> It's been an interesting experience. I mean, I I I think the book as well is it's for grown-ups as well. Like I think it's important for older South Asian women to read it and mm -hmm. to um, learn about their history and and learn about the amazing women that we come from. Raj, how can people get involved with the work that you do? Um, you've got a website for Pink Ladu, which is pinkladu.org. But what are the ways can people contribute, reach out to you and support the work that you're doing? Follow us on social media, share our work, encourage people to give out Pink Ladu when their daughters are born. You know, we are not, we're not a charity, so we don't want anyone's money. You know, we, we're not looking for that. We just want to spread our message. So you can help by spreading the message. So follow our work and share what we do. Thank you. And before we come to the end of the show, what message would you like to leave the listeners with? Um, I mean, it's kind of the motto that we have. It's, it's the slogan for Pink Ladu, which is the power is in your hand. Um, and and the, we came up with that, actually, because, you know, you make Ladu with your hands. You, you roll them like this. So it's, it's literal and figurative, right? Mm -hmm. So the power is literally in your hands. So rather than just sitting there and saying, you know, go out there and do something, make a change. You know, the next time you see a sexist custom or tradition, stand up, say no, or, you know, demand that things be done differently if you can. I think it's really important to change behavior. So yeah, the power is in your hands and it's time to sort of reclaim that and, and do something differently. Thank you, Raj. That's, that's very powerful. And I hope that everybody has enjoyed today's show. I know that I have. There's so much that I've learned and I hope that you're going to be back on the show again and share some more amazing stories and inspiration with us. But thank you so much, Raj, for being on Core Voices show today and talking to us about the amazing Pink Ladu project. Please go and support it, pinkladu.org. Check out Pink Ladu on Instagram and on Facebook and celebrate all genders and definitely celebrate your girls as well. Exactly. Thank, Thank you. It's been amazing. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.